Welcome to Kites 2021. I am delighted to welcome Roberto Brandt from Academia Nacional de Ingeniería Argentina, who will moderate Technical Session 3, Renewables. Welcome to Technical Session 3 on Renewable Energies. My name is Roberto Brandt, and I am a member of the Energy Institute of the National Academy of Engineering of Argentina. In the context of the decarbonization agenda, renewable energies undoubtedly play a pivotal role. However, as underlined by several speakers in our opening plenary, the policies and plans for an accelerated contribution of renewables to significant greenhouse gas emission reductions require structural changes in the existing economic systems and many value chains. The latter creates several opportunities and challenges. Allow me to highlight some of them. On the opportunity side, the outstanding technological progress and cost reductions experienced during recent decades, notably in wind and solar, have created unprecedented momentum for investment growth. In addition, the International Climate Change Mitigation Agenda, as well as the 2050 net zero emission plans and commitments put forward by a large number of countries and thousands of corporations has enhanced public and private efforts in the fields of research, development, demonstration, and deployment. On the challenge side, it should be noted that, as Bill Gates usually stresses, technology breakthroughs and scaling could take more time than expected. With regard to policies, there is a risk that unidimensional approaches that don't reflect the diversity of regional or national energy sourcing and transition options, or the prioritization of mandatory public regulations over market mechanisms that could help mobilize private investment in sustainable energy in the long term, could increase the cost of energy in the short and medium term. In this line, many policymakers support a green premium in the form of an extra cost that should be paid to ensure the convergence to carbon neutral scenarios. The outcome will ultimately depend on societal decisions expressed through votes and energy consumption. This session aims at providing an up-to-date view of the current and future developments of the main renewable energy technologies, while also covering the supply requirements and prospects of certain minerals that will play a key role to support an accelerated transition towards cleaner energy systems. For this purpose, we will hear from six distinguished speakers. Their bios are available on the CAEDS 2021 website, so I will introduce them only briefly. Our first speaker will be Ulrich Wagner, an energy economics professor at the Technical University of Munich and a member of ACATEC, the National Academy of Science and Engineering of Germany. He will describe the contribution of complex energy systems modeling to technology and investment decision making and to CO2 emissions management. He will be followed by Atsuo Yamada, professor of the Department of Chemical Systems Engineering at the University of Tokyo, Japan, who will cover energy conversion and storage batteries. The third speaker will be Masakatsu Sugiyama, professor of the Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology of the University of Tokyo, who will focus on hydrogen. 
The next presenter will be Eloy Alvarez Pellegrini, Secretary General of RAI, the Royal Academy of Engineering of Spain, who will share the European and Spanish development plans for hydrogen and biofuels. The fifth speaker will be our Argentine colleague, Martin Pérez de Solay, CEO of the Australian mining conglomerate Oro Cobre, recently merged with Galaxy Resources. He will discuss the supply status and prospects of raw materials that are key for the development of renewables. The last speaker will be Oscar Ferreño, Institutional Relations and Regulatory Affairs Director of Ventus and member of ANIO, the National Academy of Engineering of Uruguay, who will address variability management in wind and solar power generation. I would like to encourage the audience to submit written questions to the panel through the Zoom chat during this meeting, and we will address them after the presentations. Please note that at the end of the session, Hamed Beheshti from the German company Borean Light and Sebastian Garcia Marra from the Argentine firm Les Industries will share brief presentations on their businesses that have been selected by the World Energy Council as finalists for the Startup Energy Transition Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will enjoy this high quality immersion in the opportunities and challenges of renewable energies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my keynote on new energy system modeling, which should bring together technology, market, and society. So my first question is um, why? energy system modeling. Then I have a short remark on the methods of energy system modeling. And then the most important point, of course, the challenges and possible conclusions. So first point, why uh, energy system modeling? So if we um, consider the increasing challenges for energy systems with regard to, to uh, climate and environmental protection, energy system modeling becomes more and more important for many purposes. So this starts, uh, for instance, when looking at detailed energy management uh, concepts in a company or energy concepts in community, local in, in, in local uh, cities, or energy scenarios at a national or even at a global um, area. So energy system modeling helps understanding complex systems and it can show for instance, paths of uh, no regret or no goes, saves time and uh, avoids costly try and error experiments. So at the, at the very beginning of energy system modeling, we have to have a good picture of the state of the art of um, uh, the energy system. And in this picture, I show you one example which addresses Germany's energy consumption and emissions by application sector for the year 2017. In the upper line, we see the final energy consumption and the lower part, the CO2 emission. And just to pick out uh, two examples, if you look at the residential area, we have, of course, lots of energy for space heating. We have energy necessary for, warm, uh, for drinking warm water um, preparation, for cooking, for mechanical energy, and so on. And to get this information is already quite complicated because this is not a result of uh, national statistics, which only consider uh, the uh, consumption of energy carriers in different uh, sectors. But at the beginning, at the beginning of the energy chain of the process chain, we have the user, the user which needs energy for something. And we do not have a quite a, a solid picture um, of uh, the energy needed or the purposes for the energy needed. So this is the first step at the beginning of the energy chain, understanding uh, the, the principle of the energy system. Second example is the industry, where the picture is even more heterogeneous. 
uh, depends very much on the national situation, what kind of industry is typical for the country, so heavy industry or services and so on. And in the case of, uh, of Germany, uh, we see, for instance, a uh, lot of energy used for process heat from uh, low temperature up to higher te temperature, more than 500 degrees centigrade. And of course, the, so not, not only the terawatt hours of energy count, but the quality, what quality does this energy have? So in, in this special case, the heat, low temperature or high temperature, this is quite important when talking about substitution from, uh, from fossil energy carriers by renewable energy, by hydrogen uh, or whatever. So th this sounds uh, perhaps uh, trivial at the first sight, but it is not. It is uh, quite, quite hard work to find out um, uh, this uh, principle. So um, the second step then is um, translating the final energy consumption into CO2 emissions, because CO2 emissions are normally the aspects uh, where the um, political goals addresses to, not so much energy, but CO2 emissions uh, is the most important um, aspect. And um, this, again, a picture for, for Germany, which shows us um, the uh, emission of CO2 during uh, one year, in this case, uh, the year 2016, and now split up between the different forms of application. So lightning, um, ICT, air conditioning, mechanical energy, process cooling, process heat, space heating, hot water. And uh, this broken up to the four consumption sectors, transport, private household, industry, and commerce and services. And uh, this picture, I think, is um, very enlightening because it shows us at the first sight where the most important bars, uh, uh, pillars are here in this uh, pictures. So we see that mechanical energy in transport is uh, the dominating uh, sector. We have space heating in, uh, in uh, private households. We have process heat in industry. Uh, we would have expected that, of course and um, mechanical energy uh, for industrial purposes. So these are the most important um, consumers of, uh, of final energy. And if we look at, at the rest, we see um, lots, lots of um, uh, facts and figures which do not play such a big role. And um, well, what we learned from this picture is where we should address or focus first. So, so these are the big, the big hubs. And by the way, um, uh, divided into the direct CO2 emissions, which is uh, the lower part of the bars, and the indirect CO2 emissions, which comes from, uh, from upstream, so from power plants, from refineries, uh, and especially for dist district heating plants, and so on. And um, this is also part, of course, of the CO2 emissions related to a special application in a special um, sector. So having said this, um, a few comments to methods of energy system uh, modeling. We have many, many uh, variants. So uh, bottom-up um, uh, principles or uh, top-down uh, principles depends on, um, on the question we have to the energy modeling. So the, uh, the corresponding resolution in time and space uh, plays a, a big role. So the granularity, whether we model the energy system in periods of one year, or if we look at the electricity system, it's uh, nowadays more important to have very short time periods, uh, even going down to one second of time resolution, because the CO2 emission um, depends very much not only on the energy carrier, but in case of electricity, also on, on, the, on the time when you, when you use the electricity whether there is a lot of PV in, in the system or is it lignite power plants which dominate uh, the generation of electricity. So we have deterministic and heuristic concepts, the linear programming, Monte Carlo. And if we look at market models, um, agent modeling plays a, a, a more and more important um, role. And uh, one of the main goals um, of um, the calculation of energy scenario is um, well, to, to show possible paths in order to fulfill 
governmental goals for CO2 uh, reduction and show sensitivity of different parameters. Does it play a role or which role does it play to, to um, increase the efficiency of building or to, to switch from combustion engine to um, electric mobility, um, for instance? So um, the, um, the, the um, most challenging point, of course, is after having understood the status quo of uh, the energy system to have scenarios for, for the future. And, uh, and um, relating to this, also one, one example only, also uh, addressing the German uh, situation. Uh, sorry for lots of information inside, but I will not go in, into, into detail. Just show you what is necessary for understanding uh, the scenario technology. This picture shows us the development of, um, of uh, the electricity consumption and um, uh, generation in Germany for the years 2020, 30, 40, and 50. In the upper part, we see the generation, wh where the electricity comes from. So today, <clears throat> 361 terawatt hours still come from fossils and 258 from, from um, uh, renewables. And um, renewables will steadily increase, fossil will go down. This is the one side. But as I mentioned in the beginning, of course, the trigger for this generation is the consumption. So this is the consumption of electricity, which in the case of, of Germany will increase due to more heat pumps, due to more electric um, vehicles, um, for instance. And of course, we can go into details of any of parts of these, uh, of these bars, who is uh, the, the consumer, um, how, will con uh, how, how will the consumption of energy change over time in traffic, in households, and, um, uh, and so on. Um, so <clears throat> this is still having uh, a look at the energy system. And uh, as the title of my keynote also addresses, it's much more important and decisive in the future to couple energy system modeling with market, um, with market um, uh, principles, with societal and political aspects. And of course, we, we are engineers. We, we, we can understand the technical system quite good and simulate and model it. Uh, meanwhile, we are also able to, mark, to simulate the market, uh, different market mechanisms, for instance. Um, it's um, more complicated to simulate or make a prognosis on the user behavior. We, we are still learning uh, by statistical and societal um, um, measures to, to uh, better understand the user behavior. And the more difficult, most difficult thing is um, simulating political decisions. We are still not able to, to simulate this, and I'm afraid that we never will. So we have to, to make assumptions on what could happen um, on the political um, scale. Yes, um, <clears throat> to draw some conclusions uh, from this. Um, at the start, uh, we have the need of realistic technical models of today's energy system. So uh, this is indispensable. And the quality of our scenarios and of our prognosis depends completely on, on the realism of our models. And then we have to be very creative and find new options of technologies, how to integrate uh, renewables, find out new business cases, uh, new market mechanisms, <clears throat> uh, blockchain, for instance. And uh, these new aspects have to be implemented uh, in our um, modeling. So, then come the societal and political aspects, uh, as I mentioned, which are increasingly important. And this makes it necessary to cooperate much more than, uh, than uh, in the past with our colleagues from the corresponding faculties from societal and political um, side. Uh, very, very creative, very interesting uh, experience, by the way, bringing those faculties uh, together because the mechanisms and methods uh, we work with are quite different, but it's necessary to find uh, uh, creative ways for this uh, cooperation. Um, in the end, uh, modeling helps designing complex energy system and uh, saves a lot of time, can save 
a lot of money if we look at some dis political decisions also in Germany uh, where um, for instance the, the subsidies for the renewable were, um, uh, were, were um, declined without um, without uh, having a clear picture of the possible consequences and uh, we could have predicted many many things w without trying them out in, in a try and error uh, principle yes um, um, the the final conclusion is uh, that we scientists we we analyze possible scenarios we have to be very creative in this very cooperative uh, we can deliver sensitivity analysis for different factors so what is the consequence of phasing out of nuclear for instance co2 emissions will rise will we be able to com compensate this by by um, introducing more renewable energies is, is this realistic how much does it cost so these are the, the facts and figures we can uh, deliver and uh, hopefully as a basis for for uh, sensible political decisions Thank you very much. All right, I've talked on the impact of energy storage to the future society. My name is Atsuo Yamada from the University of Tokyo. All right, let me uh, briefly uh, into introduce myself. Uh, I started my career at the Sony Research Center for 13 years and moved to the, 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 the Tokyo Tech and now in the University of Tokyo. During that period, we are, I am staying, I, I was staying in the University of Texas with John Goodenough who uh, spent the Nobel, uh, who won the Nobel Prize uh, two years ago. So I have about 25 years career for the, the, the energy storage and battery system and battery materials. So storage is a very important term for the human beings. So if we look at the food uh, in, this, in, in the hunting area, we should eat it just after the hunting, but we invented the agriculture and low temperature storage, which makes our life very rich. And uh, now we enjoy the, the very uh, nice uh, eating cultures. And information technology is also important. Uh, we have invented the paper to make the storage for the, the information and now move to the magnetic storage and electricity storage now in the, now we're using the, the cloud storage, uh, which also enrich our daily life. And the wealth storage is also important. We invented the banking system and the economic system, uh, which can allow us to store the wealth. And that, that was very important role, that, that has important role in the present societies as well. But for the energy, Maybe we can call we are still in the, the, the hunting era because we are forced to use the energy just after it was generated, or in the many cases. If we change the culture to the freely uh, stored energy every day and the, 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 uh, whenever we like, uh, that will really largely change our, our human being society. So in that term, the battery should play a very important role. So we can categorize the, the, the energy storage system and the generating system like this. In the growth system, we have the primary battery. We cannot, uh, which we cannot make an, the rechargeable reaction. And uh, the focus on today is the secondary battery. We can make a rechargeable reaction uh, very easily. Uh, we have a fuel cell, but we, we should not call it the battery. It, I, I think it's an electric generator by the fuel supply and the gas exhaust. So we focus on the secondary battery uh, today's talk. So for the future society for the carbon neutral in the near future, we are shift, we are need to shift to the renewable energy system sites such as uh, uh, solar or wind. But unfortunately we cannot control it. So to, to make the control it, we are restore the electricity uh, for the difference of the demand and requirement to the battery and the difference of the energy or it should sometimes move to the, the, the hydrogen uh, to make the, the, the chemical reaction. Uh, for the battery system, uh, we are uh, making it, uh, making use of the electric vehicle or the, 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 or the local storage system as such as the individual house. 
So for the individual house, we can make a self-management and energy uh, by putting the solar, solar uh, cell on the roof and uh, put an electric vehicle to make, to make use of the, the vehicle to home system and make a special battery to make uh, the, the self-management of the total home system. So for the electric vehicle societies, we are the, 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 the government of the many countries have uh, setting the, the restriction in the very short term to, to prohibit the use of uh, the combustion engine, such as 2025 and 2030. So also for the, the car company like, like the Daimler and General Motors who invented the combustion engine for, for a long time ago, now begin to stop to develop the combustion engine. So movement for the electricity transportation is now very, uh, is making a very huge wave in all over the world. So for the at-risk vehicle market, it, the, the, in the, the, the next 10 years, it was said that 30 times the battery would be produced. When we move to the next stage for the infrastructure for the at-risk, the, 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 the storage, the market should be much, much larger. So the battery market is growing very, very rapidly. Maybe we can call it exponential, exponential right. So for that kind of direction towards sustainability, material sustainability, we are looking at the elemental strategy like this. So now we are looking the very the rare elements such as lithium, cobalt, and nickel, and flammable organic organics that they can cause something catch fire. So we should move to shift to more abundant elements such as sodium and iron, manganese, titanium, and install in, instead of the front and the organics, we, we can we should use maybe in for example water H2O. So such kind of direction, research direction is very important. I'm, and actually I am involved in this kind of project in Japan. So let's look, briefly look back at the history of the rechargeable battery. Maybe we can call it that we have the, the 150 years of the history, but, uh, but for the long time, only the two kinds of rechargeable battery exist at room temperature operation such as lead acid battery and nickel cadmium batteries. Uh, about 30 years ago, the nickel metal hydride battery and lithium ion battery has invented almost at the same times in Japan and the Japanese company has the uh, beginning to uh, mass, product, mass production. Now the, 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 the level of the lithium ion battery is reaching to 200 watt per kilogram, which may, well, which may call it the benchmarking and the energy density limit. If we want uh, more energy density larger than 20, 200, uh, maybe lithium metal should be used instead of the graphite, uh, which are now using, uh, or maybe we shift to the nether chemistry other than the lithium ion system. For the target of the source and the cycle and carrying the light life uh, should be set uh, much better. Uh, now it's in level of the 500 cycles and the electric vehicle, maybe we are reaching the 2000 cycle, but for the stationary use for the infrastructure we should realize that, that more than 10,000 times. And that would be, that meaning that the lifetime should be five years for portable electronics and 10 years for the electric vehicles, and maybe the 30, more than 30 years for stationary use for infrastructures. The cost is now and reaching to the 500 uh, dollar per kilowatt hour per gram, but for the infrastructure, for the huge amount of the, uh, the application, we need to reduce it to the $100 to per, per kilowatt hour. In terms of this and the elemental strategy is also important. So we can look at the power, not the energy density. So this is the level of combustion engine. So then the battery technology have exceeding, now also exceeding the, the almost exceeding the, the, the combustion engine level. And the motor technology have also realized a much larger power than the, the, the combustion engine. That is why if you experience an EV, the acceleration power is much better than the combustion engine. So, so this is the reason that the electric vehicle can make the sophisticated system for the acceleration and the, risk, and the total system for the controlling, including the self-driving. So why we call the lithium 
ion battery rather than the lithium battery. So the, the term ion has huge meaning hits in this. So if we use the lithium metal like the sorry in the, the, this is include Japanese, but then if you use the lithium metal, lithium metal is most, most efficient because it, it's higher energy density, but the, 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 the inhomogeneous reaction always causing such um, short circuits inside the battery like this. So that, that this is a very dangerous situation. So this is why that for the long time, the lithium metal battery cannot be used and commercialized. So invention of the integration system like this, integration system like this, to solve this problem. And then this is the, 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 the technology the Nobel Prize was uh, awarded for the two years ago. So instead of the, the, the use of lithium metal, we used a framework structure for material like this and graphite for the anodes was kind of oxide and phosphate for cathode materials. So the, which makes it very reversible for the reaction. So now the cathode is using such like this, including cobalt and nickel, and now shift to the lithium ion phosphate, including the, the, the abundant element and the iron. So if we increase in the amount of nickel, the energy density is increasing. And if you look at cobalt, that is a little bit stabilized for the system, but cobalt is a layer element, we, we need to remove it. And this amount of phosphate is advantageous for the cost and stability and very important for the safety issues because oxygen is not evolved from this structure by the, co the covalent uh, bonding between the phosphorus, phosphorus and oxygen in the framework structures. So for the integration chemistry, the two years ago, the Nobel Prize was the, for, were awarded to these three uh, famous professors. So I'm very happy that I worked with John Good and one of the Nobel Prize winner in the two years ago in 1997, that's um, maybe more than 25 years ago, but it was a very good memory for me. So another issue, another important issue we should consider about for the battery system is that the safety so the, the energy, high energy density mean that if, we, if that is released that in a very short time, it's a very hard, the, the, it causes very serious uh, reaction for the combustion because the present battery, including the, the organic, flammable organic electrolyte inside the battery. So we can see for in uh, the, this is very often in the newspaper for explosion or not PC or EV, and we should avoid this kind of thing. And there's very there's a serious problem for the safety uh, issues. So now in the battery development is meeting the dilemma between the safety and energy density and size of the battery. If we increasing the energy density and size of the battery for the larger, larger scale, the safety issue should be much more serious. So we, there is a trade-off between this kind of uh, size and the energy density between safety guarantees. So we need to make a compromise development for the, uh, the battery system. So we should keep this in mind. So, Bearing these kind of same background in mind, so we should think about where we are and where should we go for the next stage for the human beings. So we should did, did, did carefully discuss on this point, what is really the innovative and next generation and what is really necessary and uh, for, the, for the, 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 the higher point of view and the frontier research versus terminated research, we should distinct, distinguish them. So let us overview the present battery technologies. Of course, the lithium ion battery is the, the, the prestigious one, the, the most advanced one, and we can set it at benchmarking. So if we uh, want a high power and very long time, we can go to the capacitor system, but the energy density is very low. So for the higher energy density, uh, we should move to the another chemistry, including the use of the metal and the another chemistry and an ion transport, and start using sulfur decomposition, reversible decomposition, or use the magnesium two plus aluminum three plus battery. But they're still in the very primitive stage. We, uh, I, I did not see any promising system and device performance so far. So the most promising uh, the direction, of course, of the deliberative of lithium ion batteries using the exchanging, exchanging the electrolyte and the, 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 the replacement of lithium to sodium, much more abundant sodium 
and the placement of the electrolytes is a much more abundant aqueous system and water system. Uh, they, they, these are these are most promising and uh, short term research we should uh, we should uh, explore in the short term. And another direction is made in solid, solidification. They use using the solid electrolytes, that's a polymer and then you know inorganics. So this is the, the, the stacking level energy density can be higher, but the, this is still in the very early stage of development. And I, I, I didn't see any promising result in device and system level yet. So in the, the Japanese, Japanese uh, strategy is the, the elemental strategy that I am involved, actually involved in this project. And we were, in, we were looking at the short term. And for the long-term research, uh, there is another project in Japanese Rising 3 and the Arco Spring and uh, spending much more money. And the solidification and the, 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 the target is uh, the usual, uh, mainly for the electric vehicle and uh, the, the, the Japanese market has put huge money for these directions as well. Okay, but for the short term, maybe as I said, the, the derivatives such as the, the, the the lithium ion system derivative should be then promising for the, at least for the, the next couple of decades, I think. So it's, it's, it's a good idea to refer to TISRA's realistic strategy. They are making a strategy depending on the application, the ch changing the cathode material, lithium ion phosphate and the nickel and manganese layer and the nickel rich uh, layered materials. So for the stationary use and low cost electric vehicles, uh, they are trying to use in the lithium ion phosphate. The market of lithium ion phosphate should be expanding, expanding for, for the next decades uh, for sure. And for the middle range uh, EV or for the, 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 the power wall for the house, they are using the nickel uh, less uh, materials. But for the, the large scale, Large, large uh, vehicles. The 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 the, 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 the weight is really necessary, important. That the nickel rich direction is exploring, but uh, we should think about the safety issue for this case. For the the, the coming market, the recent mile that this mile phosphate should be dominating. I think because of the huge market for the the small vehicles for low cost vehicles here. So we should carefully looking at the, the direction for for this important materials. For the coming decades, then the cell size is larger, and the system is simplifies like this. Uh, the, the, the the hierarchy of the system is reducing, so this kind of realistic realistic direction is going on in the world, and uh, we should carefully look at this direction for the next uh, coming decades. So uh, let let let's end, end up my my talk by we should for look at this derivative for the coming year. For the long time, we should look at a uh, much more exotic system. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, everyone. I'm Masakazu Sugiyama, belonging to the University of Tokyo and the Engineering Academy of Japan. Today, my talk is on the lower of the hydrogen for massive dissemination of the renewable energy sources. And especially, I'll focus on the Japanese situation uh, targeted at the 2050 carbon neutrality goal. And as you know, the uh, intermittency of the renewable energy source power generation is the severe problem. So as is written here, the demand of the electricity uh, changes with time. And we need to have the power generation so that the uh, demand and generation uh, matches every timing. But once the uh, massive installation of the renewable source, such as the photovoltaic, uh, starts, then we definitely need uh, another adjustable power generation so that the sum of the uh, renewable and adjustable power generation matches the uh, demand of the electricity. But that actually imposes as the quite a severe control, such as the reduction of the uh, bottom line of the adjustable power generation, and also the uh, quick rise of the power generation uh, with time. So in the situation of Japan, now the penetration of the renewable is quite good, so that the uh, total amount of the cumulative installation of all the renewables is almost uh, approaching the half of the maximum power generation in Japan. 
So that actually uh, makes the quite a difficulty of the grid management, uh, as I have told you. And one example is here. In the southern part of the Japan, the Kyushu Island, the power generation uh, is uh, here, uh, combining the uh, photovoltaic and the fossil thermal generation and the nuclear there. And uh, in that particular timing of the around noon, then the power demand in that particular island is as small as this one. And they try to uh, transmit the uh, electricity to the neighboring uh, zones and uh, grids. And also they try to use the pumped hydro as a large scale electricity storage. But still, oh, there is a huge mismatch as it's written here. So they now have to uh, curtail the output of the solar power generation uh, quite frequently as it's written here. Facing that kind of situation, we are now all thinking about, again, how to uh, allow us the uh, much uh, further installation of the uh, solar and wind power generation, which are renewables. And uh, since these uh, modern renewable power sources are always giving us the uh, electricity, not the dielectric fuel, so we need to increase the electrification uh, and increase the demand of the electricity as a substitute of the uh, fossil fuel usage with electricity. And electrical vehicle is one of that method. And also in the region uh, which is uh, cooled, then uh, the heat pump is also a very nice method uh, to substitute the uh, fossil fuel usage with the electricity. And these two methods increases the demand of the electricity and reduce the demand for the fossil fuel. But uh, that uh, not only increase the uh, installation of the renewables, but also the necessity of the adjustable power sources. And that has been maintained uh, by the firing of the fossil fuel. So uh, in order to uh, make it possible, the uh, deep penetration of the renewables and deep decarbonization, uh, we need to substitute that fossil fuel with the uh, fuel, which never emits CO2 in its entire lifetime from the production to the usage. And at this particular moment, at this uh, existing moment, uh, the only technology that allows that a uh, purpose is hydrogen. So the hydrogen uh, can be used uh, for the mobilities uh, powering, and also the providing the uh, high temperature heat for industries. But more importantly, hydrogen can be used as the fuel for the electricity generation. And of course, we have another option of the uh, distributed power system uh, with the massive amount of the uh, power storage like uh, batteries. This is of course the very important alternative technology, but especially in the region uh, like uh, uh, Tokyo or uh, with a very high uh, population density, then we need to still uh, maintain uh, this kind of the centralized uh, energy distribution system in terms of the both electricity and the fuel. So in that situation, the hydrogen is a vital uh, method uh, for allowing the deep penetration of the renewables. And this is the latest uh, national uh, goal uh, for the uh, decarbonization uh, of our energy system uh, towards the 2050. Uh, at this year, the go Japanese government uh, recently uh, committed the goal of the carbon neutrality achievement. And in that particular scenario, uh, the uh, one important uh, point is the uh, increase of the electrification as is written here. And it is written that the uh, 30 to 50% increase of the electric demand uh, will be targeted. And that actually uh, is accompanied by the fraction of the renewal penetration more than 50%. And another point uh, for the sector, which is not yet electrified or uh, hard to be electrified, would be the use of the CO2 free hydrogen. And the amount of the use of the hydrogen targeted at this 2050 is 20 million ton per year. This is a large amount. 
And talking about that a penetration of the renewable electricity, actually in Japan is suffering from the shortage of the land area. So uh, according to uh, this a estimation of the possibility of the renewable installation in Japan, even uh, we follow the maximum expectation in 2050, the installation of the modern renewables like uh, photovoltaic and wind are not satisfactory. And in that uh, old estimation, the possibility of the offshore wind power generation has been dismissed. So we can still append the 30 to 40 gigawatt uh, solar uh, wind power generation, sorry, uh, to this uh, wind sector. But still, the total expected power generation is uh, something like 700 terawatt hour. And that amount is just hitting the lower uh, limit of that expected power generation by renewables, which allows for the uh, carbon neutrality target uh, at 2050. So the message here is that, at least for the case of Japan, the penetration of the renewable uh, electricity sources are quite difficult so that we can cover the uh, entire uh, amount of the electricity, renewable electricity expected, uh, which realizes the carbon neutrality target. And this is a one uh, typical case. So in order uh, for the residential res uh, installation of a, a photovoltaic to achieve uh, this number, then we need to install the photovoltaic, not only the normal rooftop, but the rooftop uh, facing to the nose and also almost all the walls and windows. This is a very extreme installation and not easy to achieve. So that's why the uh, people in Japan are expecting the another method of decarbonizing our energy system with hydrogen. And this is the a cartoon presented by the Japanese government, uh, how we can facilitate that installation of the hydrogen. So the historically, the Japanese government has been pushing the installation of the hydrogen use utilization infra infrastructure. And recently, they also focus on the uh, domestic generation of the renewable hydrogen, as is presented by this uh, very pioneering 20 megawatt, uh, sorry, 10 megawatt uh, alkaline electrolyzer installed in the Fukushima region. And this year, there will be a very important uh, demonstration of the, our import of the uh, renewed hydrogen uh, from the Obashi countries. In this particular case, the hydrogen will be coming from the Victoria, Australia to Japan by the ship uh, which can carry the liquefied hydrogen. And that kind of policy has been uh, summarized in the uh, Japanese uh, basic hydrogen strategy. And the, that uh, strategy was presented at the 2017, almost uh, four years ago. And after that, uh, there uh, is uh, now the very recent update of the uh, policy regarding the use of the hydrogen. So the Japanese government uh, aims at uh, much more aggressive installation or penetration of the fuel cell driven mobilities, not only in the personal mobility, but rather for the large mobility, like a trucks and the trains. And also the uh, aggressive cost reduction is regarded to be a necessity. And as a result, uh, as I have already mentioned, the amount of the hydrogen targeted at the uh, 2050 is 20 million ton. And the breakdown of that a uh, 20 million ton hydrogen per year usage is not uh, explicitly, explicitly written in the Japanese policy paper. But if I interpret that personally, that uh, 20 million ton per year is almost one third for the uh, power generation, electricity generation. And one third is the uh, mobilities, especially the long haul trucks and trains. And the last one third is the material uh, fabrication, such as the steel making. So this amount of the 20 million ton per year is so large 
again. So let me make some uh, light exercise of our brain. How much electricity do we need to produce that 20 million ton per year hydrogen solely by water electrolysis? And it is easy for us to answer to this question. The thousand terawatt hour per year electricity is necessary for this particular purpose. And this amount of the electricity is exactly the same one as the existing electricity generation in Japan. That means in order to obtain this amount of the hydrogen by electrolysis, we need to double the power generation uh, domestically in Japan. That is actually not easy. If we rely on the photovoltaic power generation as an example, here is the case. This is the flat around the area, very limited in Japan, and that necessary area for the generation of this particular amount of the electricity will almost occupy the uh, major flat around the area in Japan. So I'm now living in Tokyo, but I will be uh, kicked out if the Japanese government takes uh, this strategy of making the additional 10, uh, sorry, 1,000 terawatt hour electricity by photovoltaic to generate this amount of the hydrogen. But if you go to another country, like in Australia, this uh, area, which is necessary for the generation of this amount of the hydrogen, will still be possible. So we need to think about the story uh, like the, our existing case of the import in the field from other countries. In the future, we, we probably have to at least import a fraction of the, our necessary hydrogen uh, from abroad. That's why uh, Japanese government has been invested not only for the infrastructure, for the utilization of the hydrogen, but also for the uh, technology uh, which allows for the trans massive transportation and in some case storage of the hydrogen. And those are the use of the ammonia as fuel or the direct liquefaction of the hydrogen. But also we have a technology of the using some molecule uh, to stabilize the uh, hydrogen, which is the conversion between the taurine and methylcyclohexane, MCH. But one more important point is that those hydrogen uh, in ultimate sense need to be generated from the renewable source so that we can facilitate the deep decarbonization. So here is one ongoing approach of the use of the ammonia as a fuel uh, to reduce the carbon footprint out of the coal firing power generation. And the only important point here is that in order to make this 20% mixed combustion of the ammonia with the coal existing in the existing power plant, we will uh, exceed the uh, existing worldwide uh, trading of the ammonia so that we can secure the new hydrogen source. And this is the last slide. That new hydrogen source need to be CO2 free. And the point is that how much capacity can we generate that CO2 free hydrogen out of the renewable sources? Probably this would be easy because we have a very abundant land area in the entire world. But uh, people also think about the uh, use of the low cost CO2 free hydrogen. This is the, what is called the blue hydrogen. But the capacity of that generation of the blue hydrogen to cover the entire hydrogen demand in the world. This would be the question. So uh, in order to allow for the deep decarbonization of our energy system in the entire world, we probably need to cultivate the possibility of the green hydrogen generation in the accelerated manner. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. First, I would like to thank you, the CAES organization, and in particular, the Academia Nacional de Ingeniería de Argentina, uh, the possibility to address this important annual conference of CAES in the matter of energy. I would like to address the issue of hydrogen and biofuels uh, from the point of view of Europe and Spain. In the first block, I will refer to hydrogen, the second one to biofuels, and then I will finish with some final remarks. 
Well, the general context, I believe it's important in the sense that uh, since 2015 with the Paris Agreement, and in particular since 2017 with the creation of Hydrogen Council in Davos, then has been a number of studies and publications and the support of some international institutions that provide a framework for the development of the uh, strategy of hydrogen in the European Union. In terms of hydrogen itself, the uh, strategy of the European Union is clearly established in a document of the communication of the Commission of the uh, year 2020, so very recently. The priority is to produce and develop renewable hydrogen. The intention is to develop at the same time a hydrogen ecosystem that is likely to develop in a gradual way. And the European Commission recognized that the clean hydrogen is not competitive and require huge investments. The European Commission distinguished three periods, 2020-2024, from that year to 2030, and 20 years from 2030 to 2050. There are quantitative objectives, at least in the first period, 6,000 megawatts of renewable hydrogen electrolyzers. The idea is to develop installations next to existing demand centers, particularly refineries and steel plants, and develop hydrogen refueling stations. For the second period, hydrogen needs to be an intrinsic part of the integration energy system. The idea is to develop at least 40 gigawatts of renewable energy, producing 10 billion tons of hydrogen. And that because of these economies of scale and increasing quantities produced, the idea is that gradually re renewable energy becomes cost competitive. However, dedicated demand size policies will be needed. For the uh, period 2025-2030, it is assumed also that the hydrogen will become abundant and cheap, that will be used also for seasonal storage and will, needed, will be needed a European Union-wide logistic infrastructure. The advantage of this hydrogen should be that the existing gas grid could be partial utilized or repurposed. For the last period, the idea is that the uh, hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, should reach maturity, should be deployed on large scale, and should be very useful to reach all hard to decarbonize sectors. As mentioned, the huge investment are necessary. In the document of the European Commission, it is estimated a level of 24, 42 billion euros investment in electrolyzers, besides the investments needed in wind and solar energy, and the infrastructure needed for transport that is estimated for the period in 65 billion of investments. The European Commission relies very much on the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance for the investment and uh, consider also that the uh, European strategy, European investment uh, shall also be key as an instrument with the support, for instance, of the European Investment Bank. Therefore, the strategy of the European Union relies on boosting demand designing and enabling supporting framework and promoting research and innovation. The Spanish roadmap for renewable energy follows the strategy of the European Union, as is quite obvious. And our plans are established basically in detail in the Plan Nacional de Integrado de Energía y Clima, in the National Plan on Energy and Climate, for the period 2021-2030, and also with energy transition law and climate change law that is, uh, has been recently approved by the Spanish Parliament. As it is clear, the uh, strategy, Spanish strategy, is uh, in the framework of the European strategy and putting some specific objectives to Spain. In particular, 
uh, it is expected that 4,000 4, megawatts, 4 gigawatts of electrolyzer should be developed for the, uh, in this decade till 2030, that 25% of the total consumption of hydrogen in the industry should be supplied by renewable hydrogen, that also 150 buses of fuel cell electric vehicles should be in place, and roughly between 5,000 and 7,500 uh, vehicles of fuel cell electric vehicles uh, provided of fuel by hydrogen. Development of refueling stations is also contemplated with some objectives in a range of 100, 150, and it is estimated that should be needed for that development, 9,000 millions of investments of par are expected that could come from the funds of the European Union from the resilience transformation of the economy. It is uh, important to mention that the competitiveness is recognized not only by the European Union, but also by other uh, elements uh, as the international other institutions and studies. This is a graph that provides a clear picture of the differences in uh, prices between uh, hydrogen produced by natural gas or coal and renewable uh, hydrogen, that is roughly in the half, actually in the half of the estimated cost of renewable hydrogen. And also it is important to mention the sensitivity of uh, renewable hydrogen cost to the price of the electricity, as these graphs clearly shows in the horizontal uh, band, it is the, the band of the prices for fossil fuels production of hydrogen and the slopes uh, tries to show the electrolysis costs coming from different capacity factors. This graph is also uh, useful as uh, in mention the sensitivity of capacity production of number of hours uh, of production of electrolysis to the competitiveness of hydrogen. Really, uh, now I would like to uh, pass to the second block of the presentation that refers to biofuels. Biofuels really are understood uh, by the uh, uh, recent renewable energy directives that colloquially uh, it is uh, referred as RED2. Uh, because this is revision of the renewable energy directives of 2009, in which it is stated not only the objective of the gross final energy consumption, but also the objective of the uh, of the uh, penetration of uh, biofuels in transport with the number of 20 uh, of 14 in the year 2030. The idea is that uh, part of these biofuels should be advanced biofuels and at least 3.5% in the year 2030 and coming from the level of 2.2% uh, in 2020. Uh, I would like to stress that the directive uh, details sustainability criteria for the production of biofuels not only stressing the penetration of advanced biofuels, but also putting uh, some conditions and limits and criteria for the production of biofuels in, uh, in, uh, in the sense that trying not to compete with the production of uh, food by agriculture. In Spain, uh, to a certain extent, it is the same that uh, hydrogen, the strategy, it is clear in the framework of the European Union, the objective of 2020 that was previously some years ago, the level of 10% is now 8.5% with a, a, a growth from the level of, uh, temp, uh, of uh, 21 and 22 uh, of uh, arriving to 10%. The, again, the advanced biofuels uh, with a limit of 7% uh, to uh, produce biofuels from agricultural products and considerations as mentioned of the indirect land use change. To give you an idea of the situation in Spain, this graph shows you two periods, one from 20, uh, 2009 to 2012, 
and then the level of uh, 2013 to 2018, in which you can see that after a considerable drop in the year 2013, because the objectives were not uh, being complied uh, and the requirements uh, were uh, slightly changed, the level of growth was again regained to trying to obtain the level of eight to five percent in this year 2020, uh, last year 2020. In Spain, we have a local production or domestic production. We have uh, nearly 20 biodiesel plants with a capacity of roughly three million tons per year. And with actually, it is at half of level of capacity with 1.4 million tons per year. There are four bioethanol plants with a capacity below the half million uh, tons per year and a production that is more close to the full capacity of the facilities. And I would like to finish mentioning the matter of biogas because uh, the European Union is stressed the production of biogas from different uses and also for transport. It is also a stress in the Spanish uh, roadmap. In fact, in the month of July, this last July, really, the, the sorry, even I think was in, in the month of nearly August, the uh, Spanish government published a path road, uh, pathway to biogas in Spain. That is, uh, of course, contemplated in this national integrated plan for energy and climate. And in the government, as I mentioned, has recently published this roadmap for biogas. It is in relation to biogas for transport, no binding objectives, although there is the uh, indicative objective of 1% of biomethane in the year 2030 to be injected into the grid. And the roadmap includes measures and proposals for regulation, objectives, incentives for development uh, of affected zones for energy and promotion. It is important to say that really most of the uh, bio biogas facilities that are producing uh, biogas are really producing nearly 2.7 terabytes of uh, energy, but most of them most of it is going to generating, generating electricity and a small part for heat. There is only one facility in Spain that injects biomethane to the grid. And as it is well known, really, in order to be used biomethane in transport, the biogas should be uh, depurated and condi conditioned and also uh, uh, transferred to biomethane to be compatible, compatible with the uh, facilities in the gas uh, vehicles and also with the grid weather distribution on transport, although biogas is expected to be injected into the distribution grids or in facilities close to the point of production. Well, I would like to finalize with some final remarks, uh, really uh, trying to a certain extent to summarize the points that I have been raising. My first point, my first remark is that there is a favorable context for the development of renewable hydrogen, not only in the international context, as I tried to mention at the very beginning, but also in the European Union and of course in Spain. European Union supports uh, really the strategy for renewable hydrogen, and it is aware of their high cost and the huge investments that are necessary for its development. It is also worthwhile mentioning that renewable hydrogen strategy is a long-term strategy, so it implies many years of development. The Spanish strategy, to a certain extent, and mostly, mirrors the strategy of the European Union and, of course, puts objectives consistent with our size of our energy system, of our economy. The European funds for resilience and transformation are expected to be a stimulus and are expected to develop a specific projects of uh, electrolysis of hydrogen logistics in Spain. But it is worthwhile um, uh, recognize that it is unknown how development shall take place, particularly in such a long period of strategy. And referring finally to biofuels, have 
quantitative objectives for penetration in transport that are in the level of 14%, 10% in the medium term till 2030. And the, it is also worthwhile mentioning that has been a reduction on premium objectives. So try to reflect probably that the difficulty of the penetration of biofuels and renewable energy into the transport as a final energy, and also the strict requirements for sustainability that implies the development of biofuels. So this also suggests that accomplish, accomplishments of the objectives should require continuous efforts. I would like to finalize again to uh, giving thanks to the CAES, to the organization, and to the uh, Academy Nacional de Ingeniería de Argentina for giving me the opportunity as a member of the uh, Royal Academy of Engineering of Spain to address uh, this uh, distinguished audience. And I would like uh, to finalize saying thank you to all of you for your attention uh, to this presentation. Thank you again. Energy transition. Energy transition is a process of shifting the world's energy system from one based on fossil fuels to one based on clean energy. Electrification allows for the use of carbon-free electricity in place of fossil fuels, also improving the overall efficiency of the system. Electric vehicles, for instance, are more efficient than internal combustion engines. Fossil fuels are widely used because they deliver large quantities of energy per unit of volume and are easy and relatively cheap to handle and transport. They can also be stored for indefinite periods. However, they are not renewable and the increased emission of greenhouse gases challenges the achievement of climate change targets. McKinsey and Company's preliminary projections estimate peak demand for fossil fuels by 2027. To stay on track, for net zero emissions by 2050, in 2030, annual production of electric vehicles needs to be 10 times higher than it was last year, and the number of roads are charging station 31 times bigger. The installed base of renewable power generation needs to rise threefold. Global mining firms will have to increase the annual production of critical minerals by 500%. What we need for the energy transition, we need to deal with the difficulty of having many renewable sources, which is intermittency of supply combined with its unpredictability. One of the crucial features of the future energy supply systems will be the integration into a stable power supply that can track the demand curve. Sources that are designed to supply electricity continuously will be harnessed to provide base load, while the maximum demand for peak load occurs only brief around 6 p.m. on winter is about 300 hours a year. The rapid increase in demand can be satisfied by a reliable rapid response energy storage system into more easily transportable hydrogen and oxygen, and either use of fuel cells to recombine them, releasing electrical energy or burning hydrogen as a fuel. When we look at electric vehicles as a key part of the energy transition, what we have seen is the battery electric vehicles popularity is outplacing estimations driven by increased global focus on decarbonization, continued technological improvements in driving down battery costs, and increased government stimulus on the sector. Estimation of 40% electric vehicle penetration in 2030 sees lithium ion battery demand at 2,600 gigawatt hour in 2030 versus 150 gigawatt hour today, while energy storage systems should account for additional 130 gigawatt hour demand by 2030. Further, the average battery size is expected to increase as hybrids lose market share and higher performance model enter in the mix. UBS's base upside and lower and downside scenarios for 2025 see global electric vehicle penetration at 17, 28, and 7% respectively, resulting in a global battery demand between 400 and 1,600 gigawatt hour, at least three times higher than the current demand. How will the transition to electric vehicles occur? Governments globally are largely aligned with promoting electric vehicle mass adoption. To date, more than 20 countries have announced the full phase out of internal combustion en engines car sales over the next 10 to 30 years, including emerging economies. 
Moreover, more than 120 counties that account for around 85% of global road vehicle fleet have announced economy-wide net zero emission pledges. 10 million electric cars were on the world's roads in 2020, while sales of electric cars were 5% of total sales around the world. The availability of electric models expanded and new initiatives for critical battery technology were launched. Despite a turbulent year, major companies around the world are accelerating the transition to electric mobility by shifting fleets to electric vehicles and installing charging stations. Are we entering an era of electric vehicles? China has still more electric vehicles on the road than any other country in the region, but Europeans overtook China as the largest was at the world's largest buyers of electric vehicles in 2020. The US is the third largest market for electric vehicles. And after recent announcements made by the government regarding climate change, this market is expected to grow significantly. Driven by regulations, national incentives, and new sustainability mandates, 50% of new car sales across the, Europe, the European Union could be electric vehicles by 2030. Individual countries in the region provide cash incentives as well, as well which range from 2,000 euros in Italy to 9,000 euros in Germany. China's electric vehicle market enjoys several years of near doubling sales thanks to generous subsidies for buyers. But in 2019 and 2020, they were half the level given China's economic recovery and lower incentives. How the electric vehicle demand translates into battery materials? Electric vehicle demand is still uncertain, but most recent sales indicators, particularly in Europe, show a promising future. According to recent reports from UBS and Morgan Stanley, more than 60% lithium demand will come from electric vehicle battery packs. UBS expects lithium demand to increase sevenfold towards 2030, reaching 36 million EV sold, demanding close to 2 million tons of lithium carbonate equivalent. Electric vehicle technology is a research and development frontline for major OEMs, investing heavily since 2016. Particularly traditional OEMs such as VW, BMW, Hyundai, and Toyota. UBS estimates a 17.4 electric vehicle penetration by 2025, while report consensus is around 15%. If 15 million electric vehicles were sold in 2025, the total power necessary will be around 963 gigawatt hour, considering each car has around 62 kilowatt hour capacity. According to cathode chemistry, independently from other chemical compounds, all cathodes use around 11% lithium. Technology is under development, but analysts expect lithium to be the sole element to be present in all future cells. As a conclusion, UBS and Morgan Stanley estimate lithium carbonate equivalent usage in the cathode close to 600 grams per kilowatt hour, and another 100 grams per kilowatt hour may be used in the electrolyte. What is the composition of the battery market today? Affordability, diversity, and energy density of electric vehicles have made markedly increase supporting the global adoption. Battery costs are a tenth of their price in 2010. Industry battery systems cost over to previous estimates by $20 per kilowatt hour and should reach $100 per kilowatt hour by 2022, where $20 per kilowatt hour is equivalent to a 1,000 to 1,500 savings per car. Therefore, the total cost gap with conventional cars is expected to be fully closed by 2024. Battery technology is also evolving quickly. Thanks to intensive worldwide research over the past 10 years, new families of solid electrolytes have been discovered and with very high ionic conductivity, similar to liquid electrolytes, allowing this particular technology barrier to be overcome. In modern lithium ion batteries, ions move from one electrode to another across the liquid electrolyte, also called the ionic conductivity. In all solid states battery, the liquid electrolyte is replaced by a solid compound, which nevertheless allows lithium ions to migrate within it. Solid states battery represent a paradigm shift in terms of technology and could represent the next frontier by improving safety standards, power capacities, and rapid charging with lithium methyl anodes, potentially replacing graphite, which has almost 13 times higher capacity than graphite. BMW, Ford, and Samsung have invested in solid 
power batteries with the aim to commercialize solid state lithium ion batteries by 2025. Although solid state is currently 20 times more expensive than traditional lithium ion batteries. How do raw materials benefit for this energy transition? Battery metals, including cobalt, manganese, nickel, and phosphorus, among others, are the battery main components. Battery market has evolved exponentially in the last 10 years, and it's expected to continue to increase by 13 fold in the next 10 years, driving step changes in demand for raw materials, especially lithium and graphite, expected to see largest growth in the market size of eight and five times respectively. The rapid rise in raw material demand sees deficit for coming over the next decade, even if all known projects come to market. Prices need to rise to incentivize not only yield capacity to return, to return to ensure supply in 2021, but to encourage exploration, investment to medium and long-term demand. This would be a challenge for certain commodities, particularly for lithium, with deficits are projected, even when assuming that all current operations go to nameplate capacity and all down projects come online. What is the outlook for raw materials in the next few years? Commodity prices are rising as market sees a shortfall in production and investment incentivizing new supply. Lithium is a prerequisite for all current and emerging battery technologies. That lithium demand is not at risk from how the cathode technologies evolve. The contracts with cobalt, which battery markets are trying to shift away from. Market analysts projects long term CIF for lithium carbonate around $11,800 and for lithium hydroxide around $13,500, roughly 50 and 40% price increase from current levels. The future of natural graphite is subject to conjuncture between two competing materials synthetic graphite and silicon. Synthetic graphite appears to be the preferred to natural graphite when comparing performance alone in the battery, but it is significantly more expensive. The introduction of silicon into the anode is continuing to gain traction and will provide incremental performance gains to the batteries. Projections see long-term FOB price for graphite flakes at $1,100 per ton, about 51% increase from current price level. Each one of them, each electric vehicle represents uh, each electric vehicle carries 95 kilos of copper, which compares to the current 20 kilos of copper for the internal combustion engine, representing a 75% incremental, 75 kilos of incremental demand of copper. Copper demand from electric vehicles is likely to carry less risk than any other commodity, commodity because it is critical in transferring power within the electric vehicle. Copper demand is said to explode but years of underinvestment threaten to leave supply short. Projections see long-term copper at $3 per pound. Nickel is further exposed to demand from electric vehicles due to many battery technologies. With the nickel in the cathode, the movement towards using more nickel and less cobalt in this. High-performance battery require high-grade nickel-fed stocks as opposed to current grade, leading to a large capital commitment in the order of two to five billion dollars for a 20 to 40,000 tons per annum capacity plant to increase nickel purity. Projections see FOB for nickel in the long term at around $7 per pound. Question today is if we are entering a commodity super cycle and how would this impact? What we are saying is with energy transition, ESG policy and private investment could be the drivers for the next super cycle, but green bottlenecks threaten the clean energy business. There is a crucial role for the states in easing planning rules and helping companies and investors to deal with the risk. The average mining projects takes about 16 years to get approval. And this has to be improved in order to be able to meet the current demand. What part does the electric vehicle battery supply chain need to address? Currently supply chains from Europe and North America focus on global mining and Asian, and Asian refining of cathode materials. There's a huge pressure to build out European and North American supply chains to reduce costs and create jobs. Many governments and commercial banks are directing funding to the sector. Growth of a battery supply chain allows future sourcing to be optimized, reducing shipping and working capital while reducing political risks across the whole value chain. 
South America has a key role to play the energy transition. Total resources identified around the globe add to 86 billion tons as of 2020, a 39 increase, 39 percent increase from resources identified in 2018, meaning lithium is not a rare element, but its economic vi viability is challenging. Transition to clean energy keeps driving demand for the largest, for the lightest metals, lithium. The global lithium market is projected to quintuple over the next 35 years. That bodes well for countries in the lithium triangle, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, where 60% of the world identified resources. The South American region abundance is partly due to the vast salt flats, salt flats where the metal is extracted from brine, poles, and evaporated and processed, facilitated by the arid and sunny climate. However, we do not necessarily translate into accessible resources or production capacity, which require technology investment and a favorable regulatory framework to harness the power of potential resources in the lithium triangle. Argentina and the region have an enormous potential to play a key role in tomorrow's global energy environment. Argentina runs second in terms of proven reserves, fourth in lithium production among, and first among US sources of lithium inputs. Most of the mineral deposits are found in the Salas in the northwestern provinces of Jujuy, Salta, and Catamarca. There are two large mines currently in operation in Argentina, Salar de Olaroz in the province of Jujuy and Salar del Hombre Muerto in the Catamarca province. Just to finalize, uh, at Rural Cobre, we have defined the sustainability factor as our key strategic objective. And in the following slide, you can have a quick look at our performance in terms of um, carbon emissions and water consumed at operations and the way we're working to further reduce them. Our progress is uh, clear safety, environmental and social objectives and foster a culture of collaboration to drive efficiency, quality and sustainable development at our operations. Our long-term commitment to sustainability and transparent reporting is evident in the recognition from the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors and the inclusion in the Dow Jones Sustainability Australian Index. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Oscar Ferreño, and my presentation is How to Handle Intermacy or Better Variability in renewable energy, the case of Uruguay. Uruguay is a small country in Latin America with a low population density, population uh, three and a half million inhabitants, surface 180,000 uh, kilometers square, no have fossil energy resource, simple and flat topography, economic is total, totally agriculture. All possible hydroelectric potential fully developed. Annual hydroelectric production is maximal uh, 9,000 gigawatt hour and a median the 7,000 gigawatt hour and a minimal the 3,500 uh, uh, gigawatt hour. Annual electricity demand today is uh, 11,000 gigawatt hour with a growth rate close to 2% and a maximum power demand peak of 2,000 uh, megawatts. Argentina international connection is at 2,000 megawatts and there is a Brazil international connection with 570 megawatts. Argentina has abundant fossil resources. Uruguay fed the domestic electricity demand with the generation of hydroelectric plants complementing and supporting them with thermal energy imported from Argentina. Uruguay electricity system was very vulnerable to the economic and energy problems of Argentina. Different alternatives for electricity generation began to be analyzed. Nuclear power plant, regasification plant, and renewable energy. Also, wind power and photovoltaic was viewed as possible alternative. They were seen as marginal solution. It is true that the first decade of the this century, no electricity market showed shares of wind or solar energy greater than 10%. They say, let's not pretend that the wrong conventional renewable energy solved the energy problem. 
but we do want them to collaborate to do so. This route was based on the so-called intermittency of the wind and solar photovoltaic. Uruguay experience. The Uruguay experience is always that these first were unfunded. In fact, this electrical system has functional as has functioned as a laboratory where the viability of these technologies could be verified. Today, wind and photovoltaic have totally displaced fossil thermal generation, leaving this only for a backup that can be considered as energy emergency. There are several reasons for this behavior. One, solar photovoltaic and wind power are not really intermittent, but are persistent variables. Two, there is a natural complementary between the wind resource and the solar resource. Three, this is also a natural complementary between hydroelectric production from reservoir plants that allows some management of their production and wind and solar plants that are not manageable. The hydraulic phenomena are of low frequency with the variation of the wind and sun as the high frequency. Reservoir hydroelectric plant has reliability in short and medium term, but they are have not in annual terms, while photovoltaic and wind power plants are predictable in annual terms. Four, the reservoir acts as a true energy storage battery. The variable renewable energy displaces the hydroelectric plants of the reservoir and disaccumulate their natural flow. Uruguay has a great interconnection capacity with Argentina. This increases the region where renewable energy has influence and causes attenuation of the variations. It's possible to keep this in the future. The reservoirs have contributed to the integration of the variable energy. This composition of the current generation park will only be announced to supply the vegetative growth of demand for the next eight to 10 years. If we want to continue supplying electricity demand with not conventional renewable energy, we must resort to a complementary storage to that provide the, by a hydroelectric plants. It is necessary to determine what characteristics of this storage should have in terms of the reserve capacity over time. Photovoltaic plants have a clear frequency of daily variation, but it also has a seasonal variation. A photovoltaic plant park wind tracker has a capacity factor of 24% in Uruguay, but this varies between 13% for the June, July two months period to a 35% for the December, January two months period. It is more difficult to identify variations in wind capacity factor. The following graphs show the capacity factor of the best wind farm in Uruguay, totaling 1,190 for one day, for 10 days, for 30 days, and for 60 days. This is the capacity factor one day, mile to mile, uh, for one day. This is for 10 days. Factors of capacity for 10 days. This is for 30 days. And this is for 60 days. In the graph of 30 and 60 days, the difference in the capacity factor of the wind power between winter and summer can be clearly seen. Partial due to the higher density of the air in winter, a partial to the higher wind speed. That is complementary to solar photovoltaic production. On the other hand, the variations of the wind power capacity factor in 10 days are of the order of 45% in winter and 20% in summer. Will for 30 and 60, these differences are less than 10% in, in both winter and summer. This leads to suppose that the ideal is to combine the solar source with the wind source and with a storage capacity of the order of 30 days to 60 days. Let us now see in the following figure which are the storage technologies that they best adapt to these characteristics. Here is different storage technologies. Here we have a flywheel is for one, uh, uh, one hour, uh, uh, 100 kilowatt hour. Uh, then is the battery. Then is the compressor I uh, storage. 
this is a, a hydrolate uh, pump station. This is hydrogen and this is natural gas synthetic. For the characteristics of Uruguay with an annual electricity market of uh, 11 terawatt hour and a need for storage that run a month, the only technology that are adapted at the storage using, is using pure hydrogen or using synthetic natural gas, which is obtained through hydrogen. This is very interesting since the only way to decarbonize the energy matrix is to gradually replace the energy from fossil fuel when hydrogen produced by non-conventional renewable energy. The Uruguayan fossil fuel market is between four and five times the electricity market. If the mark began to be replaced by green hydrogen obtained from non-conventional renewable energy, the problem of non-conventional renewable energy variability will be gradually resolved since it is hydrogen it will also serve as storage. Two questions may arise. Is there an house potential in Uruguay? It is economic and competitive. For wind power in Uruguay, there is a rate of one megawatt each uh, 30 hectares. If we consider that there are uh, 40, uh, uh, 40, uh, 40 million hectares dedicated to agricultural tax, we see that the potential is several times than necessary. Regarding economic viability, today the production of green hydrology with dedicated wind and solar energy it will be around six dollar uh, per kilogram. The calorie value of the hydrogen is three times higher than of the fossil fuel, and the efficiency of the use of the hydrogen is electromechanical activity can be hasta twice the use of fossil fuel. That means the cost of the green hydrogen close to the cost of fossil. Also, it's not yet competitive. However, the specific technological development will bring it closer at the same point, will we have to monetize the environmental impact of continuing to emit greenhouse gas. Thank you very much.